So, hello everybody. Um, before we actually begin, um, just one small thing. So that's actually the first lab ever happening in a DrupalCon. And um, so it takes two hours, 15 minutes. Um, we will do a break of 15 minutes. So the idea is really to first give you a presentation about performance and then actually like work together with you. The problem is they told us there will be tables. There are no tables. So <laughs> we have to see, the idea is really that like the, the second hour we build groups and we all try together to make our websites or your websites actually faster. So we tweeted at the beginning um, to know if anybody has a website he could show us or he actually has access to like if we have SHS, SSH access, Drush or whatever. Is there anybody here? Yes. Yes? Yes? No one else? Okay. Hmm? Just any website you think that it's maybe, or it could get faster. And we basically will go in there and analyze it and check what And if you have a staging site kind of that, we can <laughs> check. Yes, no maybe not your live site. We will not, <laughs> we don't take any responsibilities for any broken websites. <laughs> At least. Better even SSH with Drush. Okay, so there are some. We can still build the groups later on. Um, one interesting thing is who of you has never like done anything with performance? Like enable clicking the performance button or the caching, that's not performance yet. But who knows the button and that's it? Okay. It's not about blaming or anybody, but we have to know like what is the level of knowledge. Okay, who would say he knows more than like he actually used some modules, he installed memcache, maybe even varnish? Okay, good. So we have like, <coughs> and who of you would say that he actually should sit here? <laughs> Come on, <laughs> there is it. Okay, no, because we can actually be group uh, build bigger groups. So if you say later on, hey, all the stuff we showed, I I use already. You're we wrong. can. <laughs> well, yeah. we're here to well, learn. Yes, it's not saying we don't say well, that we are. I'll figure out later whether Okay, I know. but we can also build the fourth group because there are some a lot of people and we have more s sites than than three. Okay, <coughs> so there are still people walking over there in the hand, but um, I guess we can start. Yeah, let's start with the presentation part. So first of all, did you have a good lunch? <laughs> <laughs> Great, fantastic. So. Um, that's me, I'm Fabian Franz, aka Fabianks from uh, groups.drupal.org High Performance. Some might know me, I've did some crazy things with performance in the past and now work at Tech One, where I kind of belong with all the performance things and I'm now a senior performance engineer, technical lead there and loving it. <laughs> yes, I'm Michael or aka Schnitzel or also the DrupalCon photographer. Um, so I'm a head technology at Amaze Labs, we're an agency in Zurich, and I'm doing one part of the performance in our company, so. I'm Peter, um, Das Peter on DO. Um, I'm doing performance, performance stuff because I'm forced to. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Clients want to have fast sites, and I want what the client wants. and. We will help you to achieve that. I hope so. So have fun. Um, we have the, a, a small agenda. First of all, Schnitzel already told you, we will present um, an, you an overview of, about what we think is the most important things in performance development. And that's, first of all, why things are become slow. Um, you should know that to fix it later on and that's the second part figure out what's actually slow a uh, really important thing you shouldn't just throw modules at a slow site that won't help it make will make it worse um, so next step will be how to fix things um, and there we will have several approaches and show some modules and Hopefully we can use that knowledge that we try to build here later on in the get hands dirty part. 
Um, we will have one Q&A part uh, after the presentation, and after that, it's just interaction. Talk whenever you want, ask what, what you want to ask. F yeah, feel free to search discussion in group with us. It should be really a laboratory. Let's experiment. Okay, as people are searching, um, there's one space here, one space here, there's one over there, so come on, fill in. Everybody should sit in here, because it takes two hours. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so for the first part, um, why things are or become slow? Now, actually, I would, ask, would like to ask you, what do you think? What, what causes a Drupal website? to get slow. Just throw it out. Yeah. Bad development Sorry? Bad development in the first place. Bad development, so bad code? Uh, bad uh, creation and of the database <coughs> of the fields. Of OK, bad configuration, bad code, yes? People changing nodes a lot. A lot of changes, yes? A lot of modules. A lot of modules? Traffic. Just a lot of traffic, yes? Traffic. Yeah. traffic. <laughs> Database. Big sites, yes, yeah. Uh, uh, sequential uh, latency. Sequential latency, okay, that's, yeah, can be. Wrong cache setup. Wrong cache setup, yes. Uh, third party services. For, what do you mean with first party services? Third, third. Oh, third party service. So external IP calls and stuff, external yes. Calls to, to other servers. Yes. Network, yes. Have a lot of media, images. Yeah. Images, just a lot of <laughs> content and also, yes. So basically we, we want to po po point down three, but all of the mentioned ones are correct. At the end with Drupal, complexity in any case. This can be a lot of media, a lot of content, a lot of modules, a lot of views, a lot of whatever. So the bigger or the complex, the more complex your site gets, the the slower it, it, it will be. Just, just the amount of modules that Drupal has to load via Bootstrap also already makes it slower. So, and we have to be careful that we not just add more complexity to make it fast again. So just throwing more modules in, which supposedly like change something or whatever, if your issue is that you already have too much modules, doesn't really help you. So that's really important. Then broken configuration. Um, that's actually mentioned like misconfiguration of things. So we will see this later on a bit. But um, most of the time that, that we do something wrong or we did something in the past and because the website wasn't as big and then it just got big and then we have the issue. And there is unfortunately quite some list, uh, some modules in Contrib which don't really care about performance or they're built and they test it out on 10 node pages and it works well and if you enable it, it's whatever, like one millisecond smaller, as lower or whatever. But then if you go in a big one, if you have a big site, then suddenly it can create a lot of issues. One of them is, for example, the Drupal system listings call. And um, what it does, it goes through all files to find out which modules are installed. And currently there is one core bug, or core issue, let's call it issue, um, which means that when a module is missing in, in, the, in the directory, uh, also in your file directory, on every bootstrap, he tries to find it. So if you have a website with 10,000 hits per second, he tries 10,000 times per second. Maybe the module is there, maybe the module is there, maybe the module is there, but honestly, <laughs> I guess it will not be so, um, suddenly there, so we can cache this, because the next time a, a user, like somebody realizes this, he can clear the cache, so that's system. So this is a lot of things that could make it really worse. And we're still trying to fix it. So does Peter, he is the maintainer of, or he... I'm just a reviewer re okay, okay, at you're a reviewer. that point. I'm Whatever, so he needs some help. <laughs> if you're bored any time, go to the this node and then um, fix this, help fixing it. Yeah, go to this node daddy. It's really problematic. Just remove a module that's not needed on the site, but still installed, and your site is blazingly slow. <laughs> Why should this happen? I mean, who does this? 
Okay, okay. Well, <laughs> sometimes you're lazy. Okay. Um, then stuff happens. Good. Okay, and the next one obviously is size. Size on any kind as we had complexity. So just a lot of notes, a lot of users or whatever will make your site um, slow. So these are things that you need to be aware when you build a site from the beginning. So one thing we do with our customers, we really try to find out how many nodes they will have, how many users they will have. Because there are a lot of things we can do correct or not correct from the beginning. So if you know what could cause issues, and if you know them in the beginning, you can prevent them. Because it's not, nothing easier than actually not even let problems come up, then try to fix them later. I tell you how to do this. Another nice example for complexity where every module was doing everything right in itself, but together it was a disaster was um, when I had OG, uh, OG menu. So for every organic group, um, it was creating a menu. And I had 5,000 groups because they had been imported from legacy thing. And now at my menu, try to rebuild that. And yeah, the cache clear took 10 minutes. Okay, so after we know what things could make a website slow, we really need to know what is slow. So Yeah, and there are some more or less well-known no tools to figure out what's actually going on in your code. And I'll mention some of them, um, especially for PHP itself, it's xjprof. That's a really awesome tool. I think it was developed by Facebook, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's widely adopted meanwhile. And earlier, you could use Xdebug. Um, what XHProf basically does, it, it counts or observes every function call. Uh, it records how long it takes to execute that function. It uh, records the memory consumption. And yeah, it brings that in the call stack. So you can see what are the most expensive functions, uh, what are the most called functions. And what's really important on that is if you measure, there are maybe functions that are horrible slow or called quite often, but you have to see if you can optimize that at all because some things you can spend weeks optimizing and it only brings you 1% or 2%. It's, I, I compare it, it's like you can ride a dead horse but it won't bring you far. So search for low hanging fruits, search for things that are actually actionable where you can take action and have fast results. Um, Let's yeah, let's show. I've just recorded um, how to use XHProf if you have the devil module enabled or installed. You can um, configure that. This one? Yes, this one. Um, yeah, login. <laughs> then go to configuration, development performance, uh, no devil settings, and there you can enable XHProf. And what that will do, it will add you a link to the bottom of your site. So you can click on that and open the currently created report with XHProf with the UI provided by that. So we will put up all that stuff online. You can look it up. It's just to get an idea what XHProf looks like. Um, I would say we could spend hours alone in how to analyze reports like that. Um, if someone wants to know how that works, how to work with XHProf and the file files it generates, um, yeah, let's do that in the get get hands dirty part. Um, that's how such a report looks like, actually. And it can be quite confusing at the beginning. And there is another feature that lets you compare two runs. And so you can immediately see if you have made the things better or worse. <laughs> um, there's the alternative. 
Um, who of you know the diff feature of XHProf? Have you used it before? Okay, yeah. Yeah, so th that's probably something we could. And show and that's probably something that's the most useful at all from from what I've gained from XHProf profiling because looking at a run, comparing it to r other run is quite problematic. But all you need to do, and it's almost nowhere document properly, is you're taking the run ID which is in your URL and you're putting one one equals the first run ID and you're putting run two equals the second uh, run ID and then you're getting a very nice diff report. <laughs> so uh, keep that in mind, it's really the most <coughs> useful for that. And I'll show this later. Yeah, yeah, we will show that. We'll show a diff sure. later, how useful that can be. Um, one thing is that earlier it was kind of painful to install XHProf on different systems, so there is X debug that's more widespread, I think, at the moment. And you can do similar things with that. And if anyone is interested in that, I can show you how to use it with uh, cache grind or stuff like that. Oh yeah, that's a really nice feature too here. This uh, graph generated by XHProf. It shows you basically the critical path of the program execution. And it lets you identify um, slow parts quite fast, but let it run again because often it's it's the database layer and <laughs> there you probably can't do that much so it's just an overview uh, a first step into getting into performance optimization so that's Drupal <laughs> <laughs> that's how it's executed yeah. There's also, um, if you're interested in automated um, performance testing, um, we've used it a lot for the Twig Initiative to profile all our patches. Um, there's XHProfKit by me, um, which is on GitHub, and which allows you to automize the performance testing of a site given a scenario. And um, I've now tried it out with Drupal 7. It worked out of the box, <laughs> surprisingly. Um, so you can use it with Drupal 7 as well. And you can just have it run. It will record 100 runs, then give you a diff report. And um, the only caveat is, if you want to do good XHProf, you need something, you need a physical machine. On virtual machines, you get so much fluctuation that the results are not really meaningful. But um, if you're on, for example, a dedicated server or you have your local desktop machine and have all your programs closed, <laughs> then um, you'll get very nice results and um, you can kind of automize this step, like having it run 100 times, you get very accurate results of that. You could even put it into a continuous integration workflow. Well, that was one side of profiling stuff. That was basically program execution. but. Luckily, there's something like presentation that lets users see what you're delivering. And often, that's the other slow that, that part that's actually slow. Um, and you have to profile your markup, your JavaScript, your CSS, how you serve those things. Uh, is th this compressed or do you um, aggregate stuff like do I serve 1,000 JavaScript files or 1,000 style sheets and every sheet has its own request? That really can slow down your site, especially if you don't serve it from multiple domains so that the calls have to be serialized and not parallel. Um, and there is a really nice tool that's integrated in Chrome. Uh, it's called PageSpeed. And I think I've presented just a short video about page speed tab. I think that's the page speed tab. <laughs> it's part of the developer tools. Just open the page speed tab, hit analyze, and it will tell you quite a lot what you could improve on the presentation side. Um, there are meanwhile other tabs like audit um, that also do some nicer overview of what's action actionable on your side. Um, and for people who, for some reason, don't like Chrome, there are other extensions like Wiselow. I think that was originally from Yahoo, yeah, right? Yes. And it does similar things, actually. 
<laughs> that that's other stuff you're playing right now. Oh. That's Xdebug the there, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can show that yes. too, but... <laughs> you want to show the network tab, no? Uh, we, we can show network tab from, from Chrome. Um, it shows you what requests are done, when, how long um, the requests have to wait till the stuff is delivered, how long it takes to um, process them, what what is blocked in the meantime and so on. So you really should just open the developer tools of Chrome and you have a really, really powerful tool at your hands to just do a fast yeah, analyzation of your page. And maybe one thing we see here, which is really interesting, that we're a lot of, um, we're actually talking a lot about this part here, so which is the, the blue one. So that's Drupal doing things, whatever, rendering the page, delivering to you. But then, after this is done, then your browser goes and analyzes all the HTML and all the CSS and all JavaScript and whatever. So basically, all this part in here, we cannot really fix with Drupal. We can make it easier for the browser, but this is stuff that all happens, downloading CSS, downloading JavaScript, etc. And as you see, Already here, the website is around 700 milliseconds, and 300 milliseconds are used for PHP, and the other 400 is used for displaying the stuff in the browser. So here, it would maybe make sense to focus first on this part, then actually making this faster, if it's, fa if it's easier, whatever, depending on the things that happen down there. So because I see a lot of, thi a lot of performance stuff only talking about this, and then you have 300 different JavaScript files and this takes the browser two seconds to load, to interpret, to run, and you could just get so much more with really looking at the whole thing because this is not what the user actually ta it takes, it, it's all together what happens on the yeah. browser. Yeah, it's again, know your pain points. If you don't know what to optimize, then you're just optimizing blind and you could even make things worse because you need to really analyze what are my pain points, where is my site slow, is it the server part, is it the front end part, is it the database part, is it even the network that's suddenly making things slow and cannot keep up with traffic, etc. Yeah, and last but not least, log files like the MySQL slow query log. Um, <coughs> you, on your development machines at least, you sh really should enable that. Um, during development, sometimes you want to have fast results. That doesn't necessarily mean that are the best queries. Um, so just run it on on side of your development machine and you know, sometimes take a look in it. Are there, is there stuff in it? Um, and there is also a nice tool that Fabian introduced to me, that's the PT Query Digest, that actually helps you to analyze this huge log file. It can be difficult to read, and so that's a really great tool if you want to have a fast overview over the low-hanging fruits, basically. Again, it's about know where your pain points are. Yeah, because this tool will give you the top 10 <laughs> like of your slow queries and also how much it is used and you will immediately know how much of a problem is this for your site at this point. Okay, so <coughs> after we figure out what is slow, we will do this together later so you will see more of them, but we want to fix <coughs> slow things. So we start doing this from actually from a whole request. So the first thing we are actually checking is not about Drupal at all. So one thing, it would actually start at the hardware and the network. We are not covering this. So um, we're talking about software, which is installed. Um, about performance of hardware, we think it's not really the topic here because you need to know a lot of stuff about hardware itself and networking and so. So we start here um, with Apache. Apache is the first thing which is called, if you run Apache, of course, you can also use any other web server. At the end, it's, it's close. Um, so Apache runs, and before he actually starts PHP or even Drupal, he loads its own modules. And default install installations of Apache have quite some modules installed. Of course, it's as we do it in Drupal, we just enable everything. So that the users can find out and see, oh, there's all these cool stuff, and it's exactly the same in Apache. So a lot of modules are installed, which you maybe will never use. 
So if you want to have a, a, a website, a fast website, maybe you should think or check which modules are really loaded. Do I really need them? If you don't need them, disable them because it's less stuff to load. It will be faster at the end. Um, two modules we want to um, show, one or like mention. One of them is compression. At the end, what it does, it um, when the HTML is generated in the JavaScript and CSS as well, um, it compresses it, so it's faster over the network. There are a lot of things um, in the past which said compression is not faster because you need to compress it and uncompress it, which takes CPU cycles. But now these things have so fast CPUs and um, uh, the, the notebook obviously as well, um, it really makes your site faster when the amount of data which is transferred via the network, and imagine here we have 2,000 or 3,000 different devices all fighting against the, um, to use a lot of Wi-Fi. If the data is just smaller, it will be delivered faster. And mod deflate, which is the module called, allows the Rupal to tell the Apache that it should enable compression, and then Apache will handle everything. So basically, you just need to enable it. That's it. And the next one is mod expires. So um, maybe I have to explain a bit how this works. Um, if you visit the site, and for example, there is a jQuery.js file, which is loaded in Drupal per default. Now, you visit the site, and you go to the next page. And on this page, the jQuery.js is added again. If mod expires is not in there, the um, the browser will not know that it should cache this. So what, it, what will happen, the browser goes a second time in there and checks and downloads the whole jQuery file. And it will be exactly the same, but nobody told him, hey, why not cache this for at least, whatever, two days, two weeks, two months. It will not really change over the, um, over the next time. So mod expires allows Drupal to tell via the Apache to um, set expiring headers to files and this will then um, take the browser to not load the file anymore. So basically what happens, you visit the site the first time, jQuery, JS will be loaded, he sees there is an expiring header, and it will be cached this for this amount of time, which is entered there. And the second time you go there, the browser will realize, hey, I already have this file, and I should cache it so it's not loaded at all. So you probably have only a lot of um, requests at the beginning and the next pages is only <coughs> the HTML anymore. And all the JavaScript files are already loaded. Yeah, uh, and in Drupal it's um, two weeks by default. Um, so um, we're just kind of mentioning this kind of basic things just so we are all on the same page, at least for the basics. And um, it's two weeks and you probably want to tweak your expire settings because there's most of the time, no reason why an image could not be cached for a year or more. Yes, especially Drupal, where everything you upload, if you upload an image again with the same name, it, the, the, the URL will be changed, so there's added an underline one. So, yeah, as you say, you can cache the stuff actually forever. Good, so this is Apache. Um, so check your modules and check that the needed modules by Drupal are installed. Now we go to the next point of PHP. PHP itself, I guess we could do a whole conference about PHP performance. But one thing we really want to mention are opcode caches. So what are they doing? Basically, what PHP is, it compiles um, every PHP file on every run, which is from a performance point of view not the fastest thing. And again, they don't change. How, how many times you change a PHP file on your server? So why shouldn't PHP cache the stuff after it's run the first time? There are a lot of things that the interpreter can cache. We don't really know, need to know what they're doing, but it can be cached. And also, the PHP files live usually on the disk. So you have a lot of access to the disk, which is called disk I.O., every time on every single request. So what an opcode op cache does, it first pre-compiles the files whatever this really does, but it just will be the second time will be faster and running and it keeps the files in memory. So the next time that index.php and all your module files and all the stuff is called again, he sees them in the memory and loads it. And memory is, will be faster than disk.io all the time. There is one small thing. 
you can set the size of this cache. And usually, APC, the cache size per default is 40 megabytes. This is way enough for your custom PHP script, but unfortunately not enough for Drupal. So if you have a Drupal and if you even like install commerce, the cache will be 50 megabytes, which is needed. And now you can imagine what happens. He fills it up to 40 megabytes in one request and he realizes, oh, my cache is full. So he throws away the old cached files to add the new ones. And in the next request, this happens again. And at the end, your site will be slower. So I had a lot of people, I tell them, yeah, just install the opcode cache, and they do it, and your site gets lower. That's the issue that the, the cache is not big enough. And we suggest to use 256 megabytes per site you have running. So if you have a, a server with a lot of um, websites on it, you maybe need to raise this. And for, um, yes. Right now, there are two op caches you mostly used. One of them is APC, which is for PHP 5.3 and 5.4. Um, and there, the setting is called apc.shm on the line size. There is a new one in PHP 5.5. There is the send op cache, which is, um, which is bundled in PHP. So you don't have to install anything additionally. You just enable it. And there is even, because the send op cache is around 20% faster than APC, there's a backport for PHP 5.3 and 5.4 if you're interested um, in using the future on an older PHP version. Yes, and of course there are a lot of other PHP performance things, but this will already make your site usually about 30 to 40% faster with just enabling one single module in PHP giving it enough RAM and your site is faster. Then <coughs> the next thing that also runs with Drupal is obviously the database. Um, we cover here MySQL because it's the most used database. Um, first of all, there, are, um, there is one thing. This is the, uh, the storage engine. So MySQL has different storage engines. The most widely used are MyISM and InnoDB. With Drupal 7, it's not such an issue anymore because InnoDB is the default. But um, but if you update like a site from 6 to 7 or whatever, you just need to know that InnoDB would be faster. Um, it's not the fastest engine at all, but it's the one which allows you the most features, the, mo the highest security or reliability because of, um, how are they called? The transactions. transactions. The transactions, sorry, thanks. The transactions, so you have transactions in a DB and, um, and the biggest performance. Um, another thing we want to mention is MySQL tuna.pl. Um, MySQL has a lot of settings. So if you check your my.cnf ones, there are a lot of settings you can do. And don't ask me what they all are for. But it's, there are a lot of caches and things and table caches and key caches and whatever. Um, the script MySQL tuna.pl um, checks your logs for an existing MySQL server. So it's really important that you don't run MySQL Tuner after you install the MySQL server because it, it needs statistics from the past because every time, for example, MySQL hits a cache which is already full, it locks this. And MySQL Tuner analyzes these logs and tells you, hey, in the past, you had 10 million cache misses because the cache was full. So then you can ch adapt this cache size and MySQL Tuner will directly tell you what you need to change. But um, really important here, only run this on a site which already was running for at least two weeks or so. I guess MySQL Tuner will automatically tell you as well if you run it too early. So that's really important there. And also be very, very sure that the scenario you're testing is the same as your production scenario. If, for example, um, you're having a site and then you're running because you're testing out some things, you're running some big imports that are doing lots of writes to the database and some very complicated queries, then your profile will be completely off and what you're optimizing is completely off as well. The other thing is don't blindly optimize a MySQL because um, if you see there's lots of temporary tables, yeah, well, we just increase it and then it's just telling you, well, it needs 64 gigabyte of uh, temporary tables and <laughs> you're like, uh, what? <laughs> 
And um, what you want to do at that point is you would probably want to check your slow query log and you would probably also check your queries at all that why are so many temporary tables created. And that's again, do some monitoring with Moonin or something else. Get a feeling of what is happening on your site. And that's very important because I've seen people kind of like, yeah, MySQL tuner said set it to that setting. And um, that does not always help because you could not have your scenario that you have running most of the time because some special event was happening or um, something else is kind of screwed up on the side that fixing would be much better than tuning. Caching. Yeah, next topic. We already <coughs> heard the word caching quite often and that's kind of obvious because what can you do if something slow try to avoid running it again? And that's what caching is about, especially with the lifetime later on. Try to avoid as long as possible to run it again. And for caching, it's really important that you have a strategy. Um, there's this very obvious thing like, yeah, let's do enabled page cache. Well, that will you help if you have um, very unique pages, but every it will help only for that actual page to be faster. And if you analyze your page and then you see, oh wow, I have quite often the same blocks on that, on that pages, on different pages. So it makes absolutely sense to enable block caching because um, then you will benefit or one page call will benefit from another page call because parts of that page are already rendered or prepared and you don't have to execute the whole tree again. Um, so you need to figure out what are the parts on my site that actually are the most valuable to cache? What doesn't change over time? Do we have um, things like um, in if you have locked in members, locked in users, do we have stuff that's not changed by that, not affected by this state? That's a very valuable um, object to cache because you can um, share that among every request. And I think lifetimes, you will cover that later on in, in, uh, in deep detail. Um, I'm, I personally always try to create a scenario in which um, I have what I call active caching. That means um, I set basically s silly high lifetimes and make sure that my systems invalidates these caches when um, certain actions happen because I don't like the fact that, well, okay, it's gone, do it now. Well, that was something I could cache a year. And there are modules out there that help you to do that. And I will mention uh, cache actions. Um, that allows you to uh, use rules to react on specific events to invalidate caches. And that's awesome if you have moderators that expect to see immediately what they edited on the live side. Um, you can react on node safe and immediately flush the cache. And next request will rebuild the required things. And now with the latest rules version and with all these nice fields, you can even create things like dependency chains if you have entity reference fields. You can say, okay, this node is related to another node, so we have to flush that too. Um, just be careful not to get lost. That will become really complex. Also be careful not to flush your entire site. Yeah, uh, try to avoid uh, to flush your entire site. I'm, that's always not so fun, especially if you don't have uh, fast locking or stampeding. It's, it's one keyword that, that can bring down your site pretty fast. Um, other modules uh, I recommend. I, I heard before uh, mentioned memcache, right? 
who uses memcache? There are quite a lot, and everyone with the everyone with the official memcache module, or who uses something? Who uses version three oh six or earlier? From memcache. From um, memcache. Uh, PHP extension. Who uses a PHP memcache extension three oh six or earlier? Yeah, or yeah I think. Or <laughs> I you know the versions of stuff? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, you should check. Um, if you're using three oh four, you'll have problems with wildcard flushes. If you're using three oh six, there's a very very crazy bug which can make all your rules disappear on the site, and I've had that happen to me. It can also make your theme registry disappear, because there's a really funny bug in memcache. If you request the same cache key again, directly after another, boom, it will segfault. And then what you're getting back is an empty object to Drupal, and um, this empty object will then by rules be treated as, oh, there's no rules on the site, okay. <laughs> and that was really crazy. So if you're using memcache, upgrade to 308 or downgrade to 226. Oh. Yeah, yeah that's a normal memcache, not the memcache D. So memcached has performance issues. <laughs> yeah, then I don't think it should be used to p optimize your performance. <laughs> Actually, that that's <laughs> what we want. <laughs> but but now why I really asked about memcache is um, the memcache module in Drupal or memcache itself is very limited regarding wildcard flushes and. Yeah, Drupal works with wildcard flushes, and that makes your site slow, probably. I mean, that's a huge impact. Uh, what the memcache module actually does, it, it stores your caching keys and tries to group them. And if you do a wildcard flush, it tries to find the best matching group, and it has to yeah, create internal tables to match that stuff, and that's just horrible slow. So if you have the possibility, please use Redis. Um, we don't show it right here on the slides, but you can configure it similar to uh, memcache as LRU cache, so that all stuff is automatically cleared. Um, and it, it, yeah, it's great. Well, yeah. I figured out that when I had to fix bugs in memcache module, and I fixed the bugs, and we committed that. But then I switched to Redis, <laughs> actually. Yeah. Uh, have you used memcache storage? The, like it's a, like a fork of memcache. No, I I heard about memcache storage, but I never actually used it. Yeah. Um, he showed me how to set up Redis, and it's really easy. So. A what? How high availability, multiple nodes. Yeah, it's well, it gets quite difficult at that point. But it, to do a single server is really easy. Yeah, it, it really depends on your use case as always. But um, did you ever do a memcache cluster? Yeah. Uh, with with failover um, strategy, that's you not make easy it at work. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> a, another question: Who of you now handler socket? What did you say again? Handler socket. Two people. Okay. Handler socket is something still quite new and interesting, but it's stable in Percona MySQL server now. And I want someone to finally try it out. I didn't have the time now, so I'm <laughs> searching for volunteers. Handler socket is awesome because um, they claim around 10 to 100 more performance than memcache, and it's pure MySQL. What handler socket does is it gives you a key value stored directly in MySQL. So you can, on the variable table, you could just say variable set, and then was directly pass through, and it would circumvent all the SQL query, etc. And you would probably, even from a memory perspective, just write to a memory row, and that's it. That gets later committed in that. Um, 
So um, handler socket in Percona is really something we as a Drupal community should try out as a memcache Redis, etc. thing because we are still relying heavily on MySQL and for some things as a key value store it could even in Drupal 7 still make sense. Can you spell it please? Handler socket. Okay. I think everything we mention here we will update on the um, on the yes. yeah performance lab right. side. Um, so because the, the format of this, oh, there's just a few things on the slides and we talk quite a lot, but we will make a wrap up after the session. Yeah. yeah um, on the handler socket, is that instead of Reddit? Or with no? uh, that would be yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> the point is um, it depends how your database is structured because a database write still is inexpensive operation. So if you have a mostly read-only database, maybe your mileage may vary and um, especially if you already have problems and you can scale out memcache very easily horizontally then probably so handler socket is not the thing but if you're kind of just on the mysql database anyway then you could just instead of using a slow cache database caching you could use fast database caching without having to install more things like more demons etc memcache etc so less complexity overall Could we move the, the Q and A to to later on? I, I really would like to to push on and get this presentation done so that we can yeah talk individually. <coughs> Is that okay with everyone? Yeah, yes. So I try to be short in in the next thing. Uh, I, I would like to mention Boost um, for everyone that's not familiar with Varnish or the, or doesn't have the control over the hosting environment. Boost um, is a not a module that basically stores your um, websites uh, on the file system and serves it directly from there. So not very much PHP execution is involved anymore then. And just to mention it, there are pitfalls with caching. Like mentioned before, you can get lost pretty fast in stuff like cache actions and dependencies and lifetimes and there are some other really yeah bad things like delta caching that what I call it delta caching you cache imagine you have a search site and you show different nodes and every of these nodes uses open layers to show a map in the result what happens is if you have for example panelizer um, the first result will at the open layers JavaScript library and penalizer will cache that. It makes a delta. What's the differential of the added libraries to the state before? <coughs> so the first node of the search results has the library. The second one won't have it because there is no difference to the state before. And so you, you can create broken search results. As soon as someone searches something that all search results are cached, but the first one is missing, the library isn't there. Um, there is a panelizer or panel uh, plugin. I, I promise I will release it this week <laughs> <laughs> and that will help you to uh, prevent such cases. Um, the other thing to mention is form caches. Um, Forms have a own cache and form submits won't work if the cached entry isn't there anymore. So if you cache forms shorter than the page or whatever, if, if the lifetimes don't match, forms can't be submitted anymore. So be careful with forms and caching. So on to lifetimes with Fabian now. Okay, so um, now we're going a little into the more in-depth things. Um, so the pr one of the problems with caching that he already brief briefly talked about is cache expiration. And yes, you can have, um, for example, cache actions for doing complicated things. Because one of the things we need to know first is when do we expire what? So, and of course, it's pretty simple. I have a node one, I edit it, 
well, of course, we know, okay, we need to flush the pass node one, also the alias, that's simple. The other thing is, what about our dependencies? So we have, might have for a node, we might have JavaScript, CSS attached to it, but then we also have entity reference and a node in a teaser could, for example, show the author picture. But if the author picture changes, we want it to change all over the site. And so in this case, again, we need a way to invalidate everything or we just saying, well, okay, I'm just doing time-based things and I don't care for these five minutes that for these five minutes, user is getting the wrong content. So that's one possibility to do it. Another possibility that's mainly Drupal 8, I've looked at the Drupal 7 version of cache text and it's mm, was too experimental for production use. Um, but in Drupal 8, we have stable hashtags and uh, cache tags. And in that case, we can just say, um, well, this block or this node or whatever is tagged with the user. And um, then in the end, I can just expire everything that has this user ID in some way. And that's working pretty well in that. The last thing is, um, and that's more kind of a granularity thing. I might have a different block based on who is using it. There might be a block that's different for an admin, so it might differ on a role. But I could also have an arbitrary request parameter that's kind of setting a filter or whatever, and I want one block to differ on that. So um, I have some standard granularities within Drupal per role, per user, per pass, and that's actually done by Drupal render CAD parts. Um, but kind of what we need for most sites that I've seen at least is we need to have more granularity that we kind of can extend the cache ID more to be able to say, well, I don't want to expire the block. I need different variations of the block. So adding to the cache ID that we can do that. Um, yeah. Um, so what I'm introducing now is render cache, a new kit on the block. It's two weeks old. Um, it's still very, very fresh, um, but it gives you the possibility to never write any cache action because things are expired automatically. I found kind of out that most of the time the listings are pretty fast, um, but the rendering of the entities is slow. So what we had was we had a site that was um, built completely with display suite and was rendered by view mode. And we also had some other conditions based on which view it was displayed in. And um, then what render cache does, similar to display cache, which also is two weeks old, um, is that the entity view method of the entity API is hijacked to return the cache data. And obviously you could implement whatever you want. What render cache does, it provides a render cache node module, which hijacks your node view. Um, if you're using panels, you will need something else, obviously, because that's already hijacked. Um, it hijacks the views row plug in, in, and especially for display suite, it also hijacks the views display suite render row plugin. And the nice thing about render cache, it's completely compatible with the cache from Drupal Render. And now a question, because it's been around like since seven years, I uh, know, since Drupal 7 was out, so around two or three years two years, um, who knows how the cache, ha hash cache entry within the Drupal render arrays works. <laughs> That's funny. It's Drupal 7 has the most um, easy way of caching your blocks. It's a very simple method in everything. You could just, if you have a block, you would just put a pre-render method in, a cache ID based on your conditions, and that's it, you have that block cached in a custom way, but no one knows it. There's one blog post from 2011, which is awesome, and um, still, as you see, you don't know it. Now you fortunately don't have to know it because this module is doing it for you. Um, so the point is, um, when the cache does one thing different, it never expires the cache because we don't have cache tags in Drupal 7. What, I'm, what we are doing is something completely different. Um, we are saying the cache is never expired, so you are responsible for claiming your cache. So what you need is um, man cache Redis or something else that has a least recently used strategy. There are plans for database backend, but that's future. 
Um, and now the nice thing is you just creating a cache ID at the moment I'm doing a hash because I don't want mile long hash IDs um, and that's based on the modified property of the entity so if any entity is modified that's just stored in a table that's pretty similar to um, how the Drupal 8 version of modified works funnily enough it was also committed at almost exact the same time um, independently I didn't knew about it before I <laughs> researched that. Um, the nice thing about the modified property is we can actually um, we have a we will have a flag on my list because I talked with a lot of people yesterday. Uh, who knows entity cache? Okay, another module to add to your stack because it's kind of uh, it almost never breaks unless you do a pass condition or a condition outside of your entity within your node lord or entity lord thinks entity cache will almost just always works out of the box so it's a module to if you use memcache redis or any other backend storage then entity cache is worth it there are some benchmarks that show that even with a database cache it's faster to it's 10 percent faster to use entity cache so just install it it's it's like i've never seen it break um, the other thing is, um, so now we can have this modified properties cached via the entity cache and it's loaded always automatically. The last thing is, um, what about my dependencies, conditions, what about my granularity, how can I change the hash, etc. And that's very easy, it's a long name, but there's a hook render cache entity hash alter, there's also a cache info alter and a CID alter. And that will easily uh, allow you to set the cache. By default, nodes have the revision ID, their ID, and um, their modified property hashed. But if you need, for example, a user ID, that's um, very easy to do. So you're just setting, you're getting kind of like a cache info. Cache info is like this hash cache property, which has a cache ID, granularity, uh, keys from which the CID is built and some other things. So you should really check out on Drupal.org the Drupal render cache get Drupal render cache set a little. That will help understanding that a little more in depth. And then I'm also having a context and context can be arbitrary data, but in this case is especially for example, the entity type. So I, all I'm doing is I'm putting the node UID in, I'm loading the account if the account is still valid um, because anti modified um, works that way. Um, at the moment I'm still calling it, later it could be a property with entity cache and then um, I can just put that in. Um, of course there could be a module and I'm working on that to also automatically include all references by default and then in your alter hook you could kind of exclude what you don't need. Um, but that would already make your blog um, with the user in it work. The user is changed, the modified property change and in this alter, you're kind of loading the node. You're seeing, oh, the user modified property has changed. It's done via cache get. So quite fast. And with that, all your blocks are automatically expired. Uh, all your entities are automatically expired on your site based on what they're displaying. And uh, for a fairly complex site, I've done like 30 lines of code to cache almost all entities on the site. Uh, next one, please. Yeah, that has a result. So um, that was kind of um, at a four second page load time before, and just by adding 10 lines of code, um, I brought it down by 60%. So, and I, I don't have to deal with any cache expiration or anything, don't have to deal with editors saying, well, I need this after t one minute to show, but this is okay with 10 minutes or whatever, or, um, and I can cache indefinitely until things really change and memcache will automatically throw out those things that are no longer used. Yeah, and uh, from the function itself, you see um, uh, I still have 57 milliseconds and the most at the moment is uh, modified loading because it's still going through the database but ending caching would be simple and then it's like more like six milliseconds. But still, um, that's an enormous amount of time and a new module for you to play with. Next. The nice thing is, render cache just made it into Drupal 8. 
a different version than mine, but because it's based on hashtags, and I've discussed quite a lot with Catch yesterday, um, if you want to also have hash thing, and we probably have something like that, but um, we have this hashtags-based implementation. It has been committed to Drupal 8 core, and it's active by default. So that's one thing for all the bad news that have been spreading about Drupal 8. Drupal 8 will be fast, and there will be render caching by default. You don't have to deal with it, and we're trying to do the same for the blocks as much as possible, and that will be very, very good. And you can expect kind of that kind of speed ups after it has loaded once. I'm still working to get an API to kind of be able to also, in addition to the hashtags, change the CID in at once if I need to, but to be able to do still the modified thing if I need it for some use cases where I don't want to expire the cache at all. Next. Oh, yeah, yeah. So and then, uh, then we're going on. Yeah, hope you enjoyed. Okay. So after we do some caching, we want to still check um, what we actually saw before, what explained to you that all the assets which are sent to the server, uh, to, the, to the browser, what we can do there better. First, um, there are two strategies. Um, one of them we talked about it already is compression, but not actually um, compression on a gzip level. It's just um, putting files together. And the next one is aggregation. So basically, um, one really bad thing is to have a lot of requests from the browser. So one strategy there is to have only one JavaScript file. So you as a developer, you maybe have whatever, 20, 25 files, but then they are aggregated and you send it as one single file to the browser and it contains all the JavaScript files. That's called um, aggregation and that's already in core, so you can just enter and all other stuff. Um, most of the time it's really confusing why this actually happens, and the reason is the every page flag in Drupal at JS. And what this is, is that usually when you check what a site can do, and I recently had a case that we have JavaScript which has like some sliders and maybe some pop-ups. These things, the, the chance that somebody will actually see this is really high, because it's on the front page actually. And then you have some JavaScript which is maybe only for the editors. So the editors maybe use the same theme, but they have some help information or there we had some Q-tip thingy. What you can do now is, as you know, which JavaScript files are really important, you can give it the every page flag. This means you tell the aggregation, this JavaScript file will be added to every single page and it will create a JavaScript file for all the one which have the every page flag enabled. The Q-tip, in my example, I didn't give the every page flag. So basically what will happen is that the aggregation for this file on this page will be separate. So that when the editor visits the edit page and needs the Q-tip JS, it loads the every page JavaScript file and an additional one. And this is in the end faster to like load sequentially what you actually need per page. Because we had issues that you add this Q-tip JavaScript to every single page for every single user and 99.9% .9 of the user will never even use this JavaScript file or these functions. And there are two th bad things. First, it's data transferred and JavaScript will in initialize it, they do some checks, etc. So having less JavaScript files, only the ones you really need, will make it faster. There are two modules we want to ma mention. One of them is Magic, which is really new. It allows some, um, or it came out of different themes, <coughs> which all um, implement the same things. One interesting thing is that you can put the JavaScript in the footer, and that's faster. Because usually in browsers, when there is a JavaScript file loaded, um, the browser will completely stop everything else, first load the JavaScript file, run it, and then it will continue. And with putting the JavaScript in the footer, this will happen after the page actually rendered. So the pictures and all the HTML would all be already be displayed. This can create sometimes some issues, um, but mostly it works quite well. It's but not something you just enable. You need to check your site again. And there is advanced aggregation, which is another module, and it allows you to create even more groups and a lot of different configurations with the aggregation. 
Then the pitfalls is one thing that um, we had in a lot of different things, is that you need to check what is actually really loaded from JavaScript. Um, one example we ha recently had is um, we used Facet, Facet API sliders, and it gives you this really cool feature of having um, a search with Facet API with ranges. So the user can not only say, say I need a price tag with like 100 francs or dollars, you can say I want to know from 50 to 200. What the module can do, you can either do it with drop-downs or you can do it with sliders. But we didn't need the sliders. We only wanted to have the functionality of the drop-down. The problem is the module can do both and it will start Drupal to call jQuery UI and a lot of additional stuff. And that's really heavy. That's why actually jQuery UI is not in jQuery in because it's really, really big. But just with enabling this module, Every page will load jQuery UI, jQuery sliders, and if you see at this, it's a lot of JavaScript never ever used on your website. <laughs> so what is important there, if you, have a fa if you have a website with a lot of modules and you're going deep into the JavaScript, look which JavaScript is really loaded and maybe think about, do I really need this? And if you don't need it, change it. So only load the stuff you really need. The last thing, um, from my side is uh, Varnish. Who knows Varnish? Who doesn't know Varnish? <laughs> okay, good. So Varnish is a reverse proxy. Basically what happens, you let every request going to your Drupal via Varnish. And Varnish will pass it on and when it comes back, um, it will cache the HTML if possible. And the next time, the next user comes with the exact same request, let's say some star page or some front page, um, it will say, hey, I have a cache, I have a cached site of this. And it will not ever trigger PHP, the Apache at all. It will <coughs> send the HTML, the cached HTML directly to the browser. And this is unbelievable fast. It's like 18 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds. It's actually of the of one of the main developers of FreeBSD, so they know how Linux works and they know how to make stuff fast. And um, so Varnish can really make sites really, really fast. Um, with Drupal, there are multiple uh, modules which support this. One is the Varnish module, which basically disables the page cache inside of Drupal completely because you have an external one. So you don't want to have an external one and an internal one, which could happen that you like the lifetimes are different, so the, the external one expires, but the internal one is still there. Then the external one is recreated based on the internal cache, so you just have two caches which want to do the same. So with Varnish module it disables, and it also, um, if you make um, cache clears, it will send this to the Varnish to ban this URL. So Varnish usually takes the lifetime. Drupal can send set to varnish how long the lifetime should be. Whatever, 10 minutes, 10 years, whatever you want. But as we heard before, with um, active flushing, when a node is changed, you can tell varnish, hey, this has changed. The next time a user comes, don't send him the cached version, come back to me, I will give you the newest version. And varnish module can do this. Um, but varnish module can only basically do the communication between the Drupal and the Varnish Perch module allows um, another thing that Varnish module needs uh, a connection via the CLI or via some ports, whatever. And with some hosts that's not possible or whatever. And there is another way to do this is to make a special HTTP call to Varnish. So instead of actually get a website, you can say perch this website via a normal HTTP call and the perch module will allow it to do this. And then expire or cache actions, as we heard before, is basically the things you need to say to Varnish, okay, this node has now changed, please ban it or perch it, whatever you call it. Um, expire or cache actions can do the both things. As usual, there are pitfalls with Varnish. First, SSL. If you run SSL to Varnish, he will completely stop or let's just pass it on. There's no SSL implementation inside of Varnish. There are two things to work with this. One of them is the Peter method. 
<laughs> well, well, I I've actually created a module. It's called Enhanced Page Cache, and it allows you to uh, change the CID, the caching ID of a page, and you can a enable a mode that um, removes the protocol from the caching ID. So you're storing HTTP and HTTPS calls to Drupal in the same caching entity. So that means if you site uh, got a HTTP re request, HTTPS request from a user, um, that's stored in the memory or in memcache, wherever you have the cache. And as soon as another user requests a page over HTTP, it is not present in Varnish, but it will hit the page cache of Drupal itself. And so you can save quite a bit of um, storage or memory and make it even faster for, for both protocols. And the only thing you have to take care of, use protocol relative URLs wherever you add a absolute URL. Um, the module tries its best by URL outbound alter and file URL alter to make that for that. But finally, you are in charge of that. So basically, his things it lets HTTPS run, run through Varnish and handle Drupal it. The other way is to just terminate it before Varnish. So what you can do with Nginx, for example, or with Apache or whatever you want to take, you can really easily um, build an SSL terminator, which just changes the protocol. So Nginx will decrypt it and send it uncrypted as HTTP to Drupal, and Drupal will not even realize that the whole thing was called by HTTP. Important you need to be aware that the communication between the Nginx and the Drupal is secure. Because if whatever, if it goes through another network or if it goes via the internet again, your whole SSL doesn't make sense at all. So this only is really if you can be sure that the connection between the SSL terminator and your website is secure. The next thing is, is sessions. And that's um, also important for Varnish. Whenever you have a session key, uh, a session cookie, Varnish will also say, okay, now I stop working. Because Varnish does not know anything about your site. And if you have a cookie set, this means based on this cookie, anything can happen. Like showing the username of the user in a block, or showing a block, or showing don't show a block, or whatever, everything. And or a, a product added to a card. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so basically, war if there is a session cookie, Varnish will stop um, working. We can, um, there are some Varnish um, default or Varnish example configurations. Um, one of them is uh, by Lullabot, which I mostly use, a bit adapted. So if you search for Varnish configuration Lullabot, there is one really good, which, um, which has the most important things already in there. And um, for example, what they do, a lot of Additional JavaScript things like Google Analytics, they create their own cookies. And it basically explains Varnish which cookies they should really search for or not. So if you have uh, um, a Google Analytics cookie, your website will still look the same, or the page. It's not changed based on this cookie. So these cookies will be ignored from hashing and all the stuff. And the next one is um, parameters. And back to Google Analytics again. Um, if you make um, SEO or marketing, you know all these question mark UTMA parameters in the top. And this basically tells a website which has Google Analytics run where it came for. So if you make, for example, a Facebook ad and a link, the link will contain um, some UTMA stuff. And it will tell from which Facebook page it came and all the different stuff. And they look different every time. So if any time your customer tells you, yes, we will do a Facebook campaign, this should ring a bell because this will create a lot of requests with all the time different parameters, these UTMA parameters. And basically for Varnish, every request will look different. You will not realize that the site is exactly the same. It's just these parameters which are different. So. Um, there is, unfortunately, that's not inside of the Lullabot configuration, but you have it somewhere. Yes, I have a boosted Varnish configuration that was mostly used for Drupal 6 sites, um, but it has this regex to remove UTMA 
configuration and there's also on the official Varnish site in the wiki there's something for removing the UTMA configuration parameters. Another thing is you can configure in your campaign that you want to have hash instead of uh, for the links. That's another cheap way to do it. And But um, um, really do something about it if Google Analytics and caching is a goal. I've seen a site go down by a marketing campaign. Yes, and maybe one thing we didn't mention, it's again, it's a uh, contrib modules. Um, sometimes the modules, they don't really care about how they save stuff. And sometimes they just use the session, which obviously is really cool as a developer. So you just need some information later on again. You just save it in the session and use it then. But this will cause Drupal to create a session cookie and cause Varnish to not cache the stuff. So um, <coughs> it's really important to check to your modules what is really there, what happens there. CDMs real, real quick. If you want your content delivered near to the user, use a CDN. If you're using a CDN where you just put your domain to their IP like Akamai, that's it about, and you just need to be make sure to configure it um, in a way that um, you have some other domain where Akamai can get their stuff. That's called an origin server, and there all the stuff is, is uh, pulled from. Be sure to disable redirects if you plan to do something like site down redirect to something else. It hit us. Um, we had to clear the one. Uh, we had to clear the Akamai cache, and it was not <coughs> nice. Um, the other thing is. Um, for Akamai cache exploration, um, cache purging, you can also use the Akamai module created for the White House. And um, for most other CDNs where you just have media.mydomain.com slash images or whatever to serve your images, just you want to use CDN module mostly for rewriting your URLs to go to the CDN URL, and that's about it. And CDNs are especially important if you want your content and your things that are cacheable delivered near to the user, especially for assets. So if you're doing worldwide customs, then a CDN can be very helpful and pretty easy to set up and cheap too. Okay, good. So um, now we have a small problem. The Wi-Fi still doesn't work. Whoa. So um, yes, well, it shouldn't be a problem, but um, basically we plan now to do some, some small Q&A and split up in groups and fix your sites. Um, yeah, the sites are not reachable for us right now, unless somebody has it locally. Yeah, okay. okay. Um, but so maybe we can set this up and do it all together on one screen. Yeah, um, we, we could try that. We and could try that. We, yeah, the presentation went longer than we expected, actually. But first, are there questions right now? <coughs> yes. I can you repeat it. Yeah, repeat I will it. repeat it. So Redis versus NoSQL, using NoSQL instead of Redis or even Memcache. Yes, there are some experiments. Yeah. I mean, there's a MongoDB module, but this handler socket is also kind of NoSQL for MySQL, or MariaDB at least, or Pecona MySQL. So um, it depends on kind of what you need. If you need to load a lot of things that where NoSQL is very beneficiary, and you just have not normal queries, but entity field queries, so that you can do a lot of NoSQL and your architecture is built in that way, then for sure try it out in that. But just for caching purposes, well, you could probably use MongoDB as a cheap key value store for caching as well. And you can query it also in efficient ways. So the question was, um, how can you actually cache a site um, where you have uh, 
basket and you have like a product count on every site and um, but most of the page is always the same and I've done that <laughs> um, the way I've used it I've used a cookie um, that's added via JavaScript and the only thing that was not cached um, was the user and card pages so the user could register with their card and they could look at their card and then it was just when when the card was updated I was just putting out this JavaScript that was setting this client-side cookie um, and the client-side cookie, I would just, when the page was loaded, I would update the product count via JavaScript manually. Worked fantastically well. There is a module called Auth Cache, and um, there's a new version of it, version 2, and um, there you can, by block, define how it should be cached. So it changes the, ca the, the cacheability setting in Drupal, and so you can say the whole page will be cached except this block. And the block, there are multiple ways how to load this block. One of them is Ajax. So that um, actually the whole page is loaded and there's just a placeholder for this single block. And then via Ajax, it will call Drupal with the cookie. And then your card, if the card is in this block, will be loaded. That's the, the Ajax version. There is another thing which is called Varnish ESI. And then the whole thing is actually done in Varnish. So Varnish will know that the whole page will be cached and there's, um, there's also a placeholder for this tag added into the varnish. And then the varnish will basically <coughs> do the work for you to query the backend only for this block and put it in the HTML and send it to the user. So the difference is with the Ajax, it will happen after the HTML is shown. So in the browser, you will see a bit of flicking because it will take some time. And with varnish, if you're able to do this, the page which is sent to the user already contains the updated stuff. Could you say, what was it called, Varnish ESI? Sorry? ESI. ESI. Yes, ESI, yes. It's not only Varnish, um, Nginx can also do it, um, but it's most used by Varnish. Yeah, and it was originally introduced by Akamai because there you were kind of also caching your content kind of, but you still need to build it up with different building blocks and then we could kind of get, for example, per session or per user, you could get that block also cached. So Akamai has the most um, advanced ESI <coughs> implementation, but it's also the most expensive, unfortunately. Yeah, but there is one pitfall. Um, if you have this multiple times on the site, let's say you have, you have 10 different areas where the username is shown, it will create, with the normal configuration, 10 calls to the Drupal, which means 10 Drupal bootstraps. So um, the auth cache is able to do this, the auth cache module via the Ajax implementation. So the Ajax will realize, oh, I need to load a lot of blocks. So it will send all these blocks back. Drupal will create all of them in one bootstrap and send it back. I have not yet seen an ESI implementation of this. So you just have to be worried there, yeah. Okay. <coughs> yes, uh, of course. Question. <laughs> would you recommend uh, patches? Google Smog Paste. Sorry? Google Smog Paste Kit. Would you recommend? <coughs> ah, um, so Google um, not only pushed a lot of stuff into, uh, uh, into Chrome to actually check how fast your website is. There is one Apache module called mod underline page speed, which they claim that you just enable it and it makes your site 30% faster. And basically what they do, they force to enable compression, they um, minimize uh, images and all the, the best practices. Um, they minify JavaScript. So it's just a lot of things you don't have to worry. Um, I've never used it. I've seen implementations of it seeing like 20% faster. Honestly, we do so much stuff already that mod page speed doesn't really help you anymore. So I think it's like um, a lazy version of it. But if you really want to know what is really happening, yeah. because finding bugs there will be really hard. So we just implement all the stuff that mod page speed does in your, in your own Drupal installation. So to compare it, what can I still do? That's really nice. 
but I, I had some issues and it they happened after mod page speed was enabled. And then you will not or if you want to go the debug Apache, but yeah. It can you make it slower as well. Sorry? It can make it slower. It can make it slower, yeah. yeah. There's, there's on the website you can actually run it through it, it'll tell you whether it's faster or not. Okay. Uh, we have a proof of multi-site installation on a single server with over three hundred sites. Uh, how will how will ADC cache work? So you have on one side three hundred uh, one server three hundred sites. You just need need a lot of memory. No. Multi site. Multi site. Multi site. So it's yeah. just a ah APC caches by file. So. so it's for APC it will be one single Drupal installation. Because you APC. Might <laughs> hmm? You might have a memory issue. What's different? This is, this is well, no, actually. Um, the the code base is counted as per site. So if you have one code base, two fifty six megabytes RAM is okay. If you would have yes, yeah, because, because it shows depends how much is in the site's folder. So if you've got well, if everything's in sites all or profiles, you're fine. Everything in sites all, you'd be fine then. Well, it doesn't matter. Um, it's just for APC. Mm -hmm. They have no idea about Drupal. It's PHP. It's PHP files, and it's as and as these 300 sites, they share the same files. Of course, you maybe have specific modules for specific sites. If not, it's... If, it's, if you it's want one. to know the footprint of what APC probably needs to cache, you can, of course, hit all of your 300 sites. And that's one possibility. And then there's apc.php, which I very highly recommend. There's also memcache.php and probably some other statistics tool for uh, Redis as well don't know um, they use munin which can monitor it but really you want to and this APC PHP it's in the docs folder in most installations just copy it over and we'll show you a nice graph of how many cache hits you have how much the cache is full how much um, will be in the cache kind of like um, if you have cache trashing like a lot of expirations out of the cache etc if you have cache, um, the cache could be kind of like split up in different segments. That's something you'd want to avoid. Um, so, and but a very basic idea, you could just on the command line to find for all PHP files, count that via pipe W C minus L, and you have a very good idea of how many files there are. Yes, but in your specific, it's only one side. Yeah. Because essentially, it's um, it locks across the whole database server. So you've got 300 sites, one change. You can lock the, the various tables, and you get a big problem there. Depends on what you have. We use APC on our sites, and we get an error in our log page view, which is um, cannot redeclare class insert MySQL query. And I've had a look around, and uh, APC seems to be saying it's PHP issue. PHP seems to be. Do you use rsync sometimes? Yes, that's probably the issue. There is one thing. Um, APC tries or needs to know when the file has changed. And usually, it in Linux, there are two ways how to know that the file has changed. And um, APC use default uses one of them. And, but rsync, if you do this, doesn't change it. So it can happen that um, when you rsync between servers, what we had, we have like five web servers and you rsync between them, that APC on the servers you synced to does not realize that the PHP file has changed. But we see those errors sometimes after clearing the APC cache and or restarting oh. the server and all of this, that without having done an rsync, it will then just, the errors will come up again. Yes, if you, if you clear the APC cache, it should not come back. No. Really scary. That's scary. <laughs> <laughs> Be because <laughs> that. It's not a standalone issue. We've got it as well. Okay. Xcache. What? We switched to Xcache. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Because we kept coming back, and uh, the, the hosting partner also said, well, we have similar issues on APC. Mm -hmm. So eventually, this. No, like, sorry. Xcache has a uh, has has an issue which is very very similar. Where <laughs> 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 I know what it is, I understand it. Um, there's an issue with this cache that gives you exactly the same 
exactly the same error message, but it happens if you've got multiple Drupal into them and you're running them same, through the same Xcache. We have that on APC. Yeah. Well, that might be the reason, because Xcache uh, has some weird difficulty in differentiating between the two files, because somehow it knows that they are actually the same, even though you've got two versions of it. I've come across but what it then does is, because they've got inkling, um, if it's loading from one, it, it ends up loading Um, and the way, the only way we've got around it is to run, because we found it with running a live dev and test instance on the same Apache instance. So what we've done is we've just got a separate Apache instance down for each one so that we know that um, Xcache is running on each individual one. So it is possible that the similar things happen. Yeah. Right. There's also an advanced setting in APC which is a real pass cache and there's some settings where you can set up real pass to be treated differently. And I know that some distributions did at one time configure that wrong. Um, so that might be the issue. So um, real pass at least should point to the, uh, there should be something findable with your error message and real pass APC. Um, because that kind of sounds like the issue. What Drupal does is it does exactly like he explained, it does relative includes. So in APC, it thinks it's the same, but if you do a real pass lookup, then it will do a whole file system lookup and, and see, well, that pass is actually different. And in that case, um, you will have a little slower performance because the Drupal uh, will need to do, a, uh, the APC will need to do a file system lookup uh, first to find the right version. But depending where you have it, the impact might not be much, just measure, measure it. Um, but it should at least stabilize your site so you never get that error again. Um, yeah. Or another thing I would suggest, um, there are still both um, rooms for free uh, free there. So maybe let's create an APC slash Xdebug um, redeclared issue buff and we can find the stuff. Because we had it as well and for us it was the rsync issue. But yes, there is like real path and things. And maybe if the website now works. Yeah, and maybe I, I'd like to uh, interfere here a little bit. And we, we see already groupings form like the APC problems group. And maybe it's a good idea to uh, uh, have a break soon and, and talk uh, more interactively mm. while having a coffee or something. Yes. Who is in for that? So one thing, just one thing I want to show. <laughs> no, so no, it's just I, I. There are other questions than APC, yes. and and there are so people they, they yeah. yeah. So, so what I can uh, suggest is um, APC.php, and it basically allows you to see like where the files are coming from. Um, if you're logged in, you see this as well, and um, yeah. So you see we have rather big one. Yes. Yes, I never tried it. I'm happy to try it out on one of our sites. You like you tried it, okay, but you recommend it. It's I, have hmm? yes. 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 I have it locally as a drop-in replacement. It's okay. Yeah. It's but absolutely it free, awesome. Yeah. The earlier, the send, uh, it's free, yeah. Yeah. No, it's, yes. it's, no, it's for free. free. Yes. <laughs> this is not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm happy with these, so. From Mcache, there's the one which is copied from this one, which you know, but there's also PHP Mcache admin, which is far better than this one. Than this one? PHP Mcache admin. So yeah. that's. Yeah, there's the basic one which was derived from APC, and there's one which is called PHP Mcache admin, and it shows it's much more powerful. Oh yeah, I've used that, it's quite good. Yeah, you can actually... Um, yeah, uh, what he said for everyone, there's a PHP memcache admin, which is much better than kind of just the default port. And yeah, we, we should all try it out. The presentation page. Okay, okay. good. Yes. Uh, I've been using Nginx microcaching. Uh, is that a good solution uh, in order to not, to not have uh, varnish uh, in many cases? With no microcache. What is it doing? 
Uh, it's actually caching for a few seconds uh, the HTML output, <coughs> but it does it in Nginx. It doesn't need anything else. Do you have such sites that, uh, and like, do you have so many requests to the same page in the same second? Uh, if you have a Facebook post, for example, one of the pages, you have 1,000 visitors in a few seconds. So instead of rendering the page for every one, yes, so render it once per second, for example. And but you, you you don't have like. Uh, perching or flushing, it's just... No, 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 no flushing, nothing. Yeah. Uh, once per one second, the uh, grace oh, value. One doesn't have... Um, one has a grace value, but one also has a protection. So if you have 1,000 requests coming in for the same page, there's only one backend request. So uh, also you could set a cache time of like five seconds or whatever in, in one is for, for your pages. And... Um, you would still be fine, kind of in that. Um, so one is to support a pseudo micro caching, just um, call the protection layer here that um, there's only one backend request for every front end request coming in. And another question uh, Are you moving away from MySQL? Are you going to MariaDB or extra? Or, or we were discussing this while we were yeah. preparing this presentation. <laughs> um, I guess we all will try it out. I have it installed locally, but I'm I'm a bad example. I'm working with Windows, you know. <laughs> um, so, but even on Windows, it works as a drop-in replacement locally. I didn't switch on our development mach machines, but that will be the next step, so that we have testing environment running with MariaDB. Okay, I'm nice. But which one, Maria or Pecona? Actually, using both. We, are, we, we started with Pecona mainly because of, of some tools we had available, uh, but we're switching to MariaDB, which is basically where the community is going. Right. Uh, so, if for the, the, those of you who use uh, Debian or Ubuntu or whichever, uh, Red Hat, they're all migrating to MariaDB rather than MySQL. So yes, so maybe to explain. Yes, so maybe explain for, does anybody not know what MariaDB is? Okay, so um, basically when um, Oracle took over MySQL, there was like a community initiative that um, we want to, or they don't want to, how to say it? It's just... Everyone hates Oracle? Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> we don't like them, so uh, we... There, um, there was actually a clause within, um, within MySQL not to sell it to Oracle, but the problem was um, it was bought by Sun and then Sun was bought by Oracle, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so basically Oracle owns now MySQL and some people don't like this, so most of the main developers, they said, okay, we fork it and it's called now MariaDB and it's, um, it's a drop-in replacement for MySQL and um, it has a lot of uh, <coughs> new cool things like a new storage engine, which is a drop-in replacement for InnoDB, but, and how is it called? X to the B, yeah. Yeah, so it's really fast and they just, um, <laughs> it, at the beginning, it. So we're, we're taking basically uh, concurrency and response time. Okay. Um, yes. It, it is upwards, I think it's up to 350% faster than standard in a DB, both in terms of writes and concurrency. Okay, so basically MariaDB is now fully open source organized and um, they... Fast. And, and it's fast. <laughs> so maybe <laughs> you want to you wanna use it, give it a shot, and they claim it's a drop-in replacement. So, it is. Yeah. Good. Do you Next question. Do you specific uh, MariaDB configuration to get those gains? Uh, uh, obviously you, have, you have, to, you have to, to tell it to load the, the, uh, the, the non-standard InnoDB engine, mm -hmm. but besides that, it's pretty much standard. Uh, you get uh, some other metrics which are nice, like uh, you got that in, in later versions of MySQL as well, which was mainly uh, granulation of, of slow queries smaller than one second, rather than, you know, I would like to see queries that are slower than one second, you can get to two microseconds now. You can, yeah. do, you can do stuff like, uh, please show me all queries in the slow log that does not use indexes. 
uses turntables, sequential scans. Okay, 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 it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's coffee talk. Yes. Okay, another question. So caching, REST a a calls, and all, uh, all other stuff? Yeah, not, not really, like, uh, calls. Okay, well, whatever. So yeah, yeah, external like calls yeah. to services, how to cache them? I could imagine um, two strategies. One of them just treat it as a slow Drupal. So basically try to cache it inside of Drupal. So with varnish and whatever. So to make your site fast in the beginning or um, to basically think about can you use cache get cache sets when you query the external ser service. You can't no. make the service faster, so no. there's no... Like yes. Oh, well, act actually, there's one thing we're talking about that in Drupal 8 as well. And the point is, um, you have cache expiration, you have cache invalidation, and those should be two different time values. Because what you can kind of do is a very simple strategy is you can still um, deliver outdated content to users, and then in the back end, you are queuing a new request to get the data new in. So um, there's two strategies for that. First of all, you're setting a different invalidation time than your expiration time. Expiration time means during the request that this is created in, you need to actually rebuild the object so some users get a slow side. Um, invalidation means at this point it's invalid, but at this point we are trying to recreate it. So if something is requested frequently, what happens is one request um, will have this um, will have this limit and will set a lock. This lock, and then you can either have this request just pass through and cache it again, or uh, with the updated data. But if that takes a long time because the uh, external service could be slow, my um, recommendation would be to actually put it into a queue, put everything you need, like the user ID or whatever you need for that request to succeed into a queue, and then do the cache set there. And during that time, all users will still get the old content, but at one time your queue will kind of succeed. And the nice thing about using a queue and the queue API is that once that no longer scales, what you can do is you can very easily scale out horizontally because then you can just use another queue manager um, that's kind of um, delivering your queues for you. And then you can kind of split this up and you can have like, just put in 20 boxes that are responsible for doing the external requests. And then you kind of have the problem circumvented in a way that um, you could also have the queue retry until the service succeeds, etc., and that way your users never get a slow side. So maybe you want to hire him. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned um, locking. Have you ever had any fun and games with Drupal's uh, built-in kind of lock away system and the fact that it does that rather a lot at times? Uh, what was the question? So for example, if you um, uh, if Drupal's recreating the variables, um, yes. it will basically do do a lock and you've got a lock of currency you get kind of stampede problems and so the problem is lock stampedes. So I've talked about locking. Locking means you want only one request to succeed and the others to do. We've debated especially the variable issue to DAS <laughs> for Drupal 7 um, because there's two strategies you can do. We found that in most cases it's faster to go to the database to do the query than to wait for the other request that's somewhere rebuilding the log to do it. But there was unfortunately a lot of bike shedding, so that issue didn't quite get through. Um, yeah, happens. Um, but on the other hand, um, Locking, I can also tell an interesting story. If you have any old web server where PHP and is still set to 12 for the log, and you are using, uh, you will get very strange log errors because then the granularity of the log is 
lower than what that is and a request that requesting a log twice will get a log failure. It's a very <laughs> strange thing, but yeah, just as a side note. But um, for locking, there's also the strategy to put it to memcache, for example. Um, locking in memcache is very fast. Um, you can even implement a whole queue within memcache very easily by just using one key and that you are there's an increase method in memcache so you can increase it then you get a new slot everywhere and that works very well if you have a multiple writer one reader environment again that's an optimization you can do if you kind of need an in-memory queue very simple just need one reader and that's kind of reading this out and then um, putting those things in a queue or something that's another possibility but where you can do things but uh, locking again exchange it with memcache logging for example this basically we haven't quite resolved that debate that was going on about how to fix it in Drupal 8 and they haven't quite got rid of it. So, so the, like I said the argument that, that happened about um, whether it should go to the database or not. Yeah in Drupal 8 we have CMI and state and other things so we still have the same discussion but on a different level. <laughs> Yeah, so Redis probably also has a log ink replacement for Drupal 7. So I guess before we actually like try to, I guess we can make it that people which are still interested and still discussing, they just stay here and we can make whatever some groups. Just to summarize the whole thing we did right now, I guess this is <coughs> the most important thing we see from a lot of nights spending making sites faster. Measure the stuff first, analyze the measuring, optimize based on your analyzing and measuring and do this again. So please don't just go on Drupal.org and say, okay, I install now Entity Cache. Or even worse, multiple modules at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> because it can make it even worse and it can break your site, whatever. So really take performance improvements as something you wanna measure, you wanna analyze, and then you optimize based on this and Italy will be much more happy and um, at the end. So, um, yes, are there any specific topics you are like, I because I see a lot of people say, did you ever had this issue or whatever? I hear like APC, that's maybe one thing we can do. One question is like, is anybody interested in reading X XHProf? Because that's one thing I had a really big issue is like actually understanding what is really happening there. So who is interested in XHProf? Okay. <laughs> Any uh, other things? Uh, I may well be on my own here, but um, caching and improving performance on Windows. Yeah, you're this is, <laughs> 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 it is different. There are, you know, the, the main tools that are recommended for doing it on, on Linux, some of them just aren't available, so you have to use something else. So it's like, you know, I can see what the theory is. What do I actually use to do yeah, it? Okay. Let's, so let's who else would be interested in Windows caching? No one. <laughs> nope. Well, <laughs> one person. You know, you know, we are still here the whole week. So, and honestly, we're really passionate about uh, about performance. So, I guess just connect with each other, whatever. Yeah. Go for dinner, and discuss the stuff. Okay. Any other specific interest of the people which didn't raise the hand for XH Prof? Because I guess we can only Advanced show. Varnish. Sorry. Advanced varnish. Advanced varnish. Yeah. Who else would be interested in varnish? Advanced. Varnish. Okay. Anything else? Because we could do two groups that XHProf says here and you maybe go out and sit on the ground and discuss the stuff. <laughs> yeah, you. <laughs> to create our own buff out there. Okay, should we do this? So we make XHProf in here, we show some sites and um, outside we make a wa advanced varnish. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Oh yes, by the way, um, as this is really new in labs, um, <laughs> even we couldn't make the presentation as we wanted because of the lovely internet, we're still interested in um, take the survey for the presentation and just um, do it. Not yet, but you Excuse me. Um, you couldn't explain a bit about the blocks yeah, and it happening ten times with the shopping cart caching. Yes. You know, uh, I didn't get the bit where you said auth, auth cache what? If, it, if the name is in a separate block, it will call that block ten times, will it? No, if you have ten different blocks. Oh, okay. Which all 
should load it via auth cache yes. to make 10 requests. Okay. Because Varnish is not, you're not able to combine multiple Blocks. ESI tags, uh, which would happen. But okay, with so auth cache via the Ajax, yeah. there he is able to combine and make only one request. Because so Ajax ten blocks. But if I only, so if I, only have, if I only have one block, I don't have then to worry about it. Okay, cool. But sure. if I have multiple blocks, then I have to use auth cache or yes. try something fancy with it. Yeah. 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 Hi. How are you doing? Yeah. So you're you got your bearings and you're set to be. Yeah. Yes. I really I really hope we could do something like yes. classes style and Trick not things. just this well, makes that almost impossible. Uh, <laughs> I really I really the way I really uses would love to have this format where we can become interactive yes. and actually that enforces do stuff and yeah. Yeah. just talk yeah. about yeah. that. It was here also for that. Too. Are you uh, sure with APC enabled? Even if the thing is with with uh, uh, because not because APC hooks into file exists. Uh, file. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, in terms yeah, of one thing you have is your RSync stuff. Yes. Really, really There's a sense of no stuff. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I wonder and then, and then you will then you then you brace for afterwards. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. 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 And, and I, I, if you run I, I, no stat and you don't like very much, you know, stuff. just run a stat. I don't feel I like I have any other stuff. Exactly. Yes. Okay. So can we please do the discussions outside that we can do the XH prof? We only have like 25 minutes. Well, he did. You need to ask him. You're talking about, you know, briefly about handle socket. Well, he did. And you're talking about memcache and Redis at the same time. But there's actually an adaptation in fairly stable. As of a couple of years ago, of MariaDB and under Kona, yeah. it actually acts as memcache. So you could actually use yes, yes, yeah, yeah, via memcache and have persistent memcache. Yes. Yeah. Which means if you reload the service, you still have your cache. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, okay. So each XH prof. Um, I've just got here a normal Drupal site and. Um, maybe can you close the door out there? Yeah, that would be great. So um, when you want to install XHProf on your site, you install the devil module. There was an XHProf module, but um, now it's in devil inside. And after you have enabled devil, there is um, a new checkbox you can enable, and it's devil. And it needs two things. One of them is um, a file system path where XHProf, the directory, so you download XHProf, from, well, no internet, doesn't matter. You download it and um, you put it somewhere and I have it here in my, I don't know, there is like xhprof. So that's really just the contain, the, the content of the XML, uh, of the zip file. And you just put this in there. So I need to know the URL, just one second. Whatever, I put this in there and this, basically knows then where the site is mm. and the xhprof html then is in here so uh, this is what you need you have to add the no huh? no okay it will search for xhprof lib so it needs ah. to know first where the php files are because this will be included and then it needs to know where to put the link and after you've done this it will automatically run so now when i visit the page I have at the bottom here an xhprof output link. This is done by devil module and I can open it and it will show me my <laughs> site. And you see it's 372 millis. So let's go from the top to the bottom. The first one is, um, is the total time overall that it took to the website to generate. So basically this should be fairly the same as we have here. So if we check this here, now it's crazy slow. It's always like that. <laughs> so we had five seconds. Interesting. So let's see the XH prof for this. And you don't, it's not the same. So probably it was some DNS stuff or whatever. So you see here, it took now 331 seconds and the XH prof for it 
says 276. You see it here, that's actually, um, it takes 286 times of waiting, that's the PHP, and 44 uh, milliseconds for receiving, so it's around the same. Um, the next one, I don't know. What's this one? I never used this one. What is this one? What's the difference between this and this? Uh, I, I guess it's I/O time. Well, what's actually um, CPU processing, yeah. and there is other yeah. stuff that has to be done. So <laughs> that's the deal. Good. So then we have memory usage overall, um, which is interesting if you want to know like where do you need to set your memory limits, and there is also um, peak setting, which can also be interesting. So that the peak is the, is the 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 most memory used ever because sometimes module will use memory and release it aga uh, again. And um, here you see the, uh, the the inclusive, so what it used overall. And then the number of function calls. So we see 22,000 functions are called with uh, Drupal site. Important here, I'm now user one. So this is not what you really should use for um, using the performance of your website because there's a lot of stuff could happen because I'm the user one. Um, if you want to see this as locked out and you open the site as a local, you'd see the XHProf is not there. This is because it's not running. So basically what you need to do, you need to set the setting. And I guess I just disabled the Wi-Fi here now. So in here in Devil, there is an access developer information um, permission, and if you give this to, to anonymous users, only for testing, <laughs> <laughs> then afterwards, you will have the XHprof here as well, and now we see it's actually in here really fast. So we see it took like um, uh, four microseconds, which is, or four thousand, well, four milliseconds, let's say it this way, and um, we see this is already really fast, and the reason is quite easy to find, but um, let's check first the one which <coughs> was not cached, because this was the thing. So what we see now here is the top 100 functions sorted by inclusive wall time in microseconds. So um, it does not show you all of them, because as we saw, there were, there were 20,000 two-function calls, not of them all are different functions, but there's but it shows you the top 100, which is where you want to go. And it's like in the call stack, and I'm not sure if this one works on my local. It works. So basically, it's from top to bottom. So the main um, function name will all the time be at the at the top. And the important is now how to read the things because there are two. Um, important things. One of them is the inclusive wall time and the one of the other one is the exclusive wall time. The inclusive wall time is basically the function and all its childs together. The exclusive wall time is the function that it really, the time it took to only run this single function. So main, for example, just, it first looks, ooh, it's really slow, but actually it just calls everything else. So that's and it itself, it had only 173 microseconds, so that's not the things you're interested in. So we can sort. So one thing you can do is sort by exclusive wall time, and we already see uh, PDO statement execute. This basically makes the, the calls to MySQL. So we see at the end, we had 97 calls to the database, and they took all together, not each 97 of them, all together took um, 48 milliseconds. Then we see unserialize, called 270 times. We see Drupal static, and then it goes down. So um, now, of course, it would be interesting, okay, what type of SQL queries they run. The thing is, you don't see any arguments or at all. So it will only tell you um, the parameters, how many times they're called. But it's interesting to basically go through because um, PDO statement executed, if you click on it, it will open this function and this type it will show you which parent function was this called from. So you go now through the call stack and if you click here, we see that um, database statement execute actually calls 
these four functions and is called by query. And we can go into query and now it gets big but query is called by these four functions and calls this one, whatever. And if we go now, if we check the inclusive CPU, there is DB query, and then you see database cache get multiple. So the caching actually is makes 49 calls to the, to the database where there are 90 in total, so 50% are only cache calls, and I don't have any memcache or Redis or anything installed here. So that's, for example, one thing. That's what he said before, check what you really can optimize. Because if you want to optimize down here, you can't get rid of database. Well, you can try, maybe it will end <laughs> up. But we can, there is cache, it's blockable, so we can change the cache. So let's try another, like Redis or Memcache or whatever you want to try. So that would be one thing you could there. Um, and, yes. and yeah, it doesn't make sense to cache the cache. Again, like that's not the low hanging fruit we are looking for. Yes. Um, that's actually a rather easy side. That's a bit, uh, a bit hard to, to find things. But <laughs> um, let's see, um, for example, the locked in. Why is this so fast? And we can maybe compare it to the normal one. And we see that um, in here, if we check by exclusive wall time, it's load user user module with 869 microseconds. So it, the whole thing is really fast. And actually, if we check the call graph, because this is interesting now here, we see why this whole thing is so fast. Um, this is the whole um, stack, what happened. That's a very easy one now. But we see that um, it's Drupal serve page from cache and it loads the whole thing it makes only 10 calls to, oh, sorry, where's the cache get? Somewhere it should be. No, that's a variable get. It's a bit hard to find sometimes because you can't search, it's a picture. Ah, oh, here, cache get, database, cache get, cache get multiple. So a lot of things will actually be called and you see there is only one call. So the only thing that happens, it makes a call to the cache page, loads it, delivers it, finished. So if, for example, I'm going here and on my local, I clear the cache page table. So we see here, surprisingly, there is the front page cached. I remove this and now we do the whole thing again. And now we can look at it. It's, it takes longer. So, and you see, so also don't be confused by your own caching stuff you already implemented. <laughs> because, yeah, the first time it's load, and so you, you need to know a bit what happens on your site, what is installed, what is not installed. Yeah, but that's the difference between cold caches and warm caches. You, you have to know which state you're actually profiling and only compare the same state, uh, only compare the same states with which each other, otherwise you would go nuts. It's like, what? Yes, then also some things, um, sometimes it's interesting to see what happens during a node save. Um, if you want to devil this or XHProf this, you will end up in some issues. So let's go here and we take whatever, um, some, some node uh, without this lovely overlay here. So, <laughs> like so overlay in new ways. <laughs> now you see there is XHProf for this page and I click save. And now I want to see the XHProf, and you will see there, if you go in deep, there is never a node safe in there. Any ideas why? <laughs> it does a redirect. It does a redirect, exactly. correct. So if we actually look at the node safe, now we use the network tab. So if you remove all this and only say you want to see documents, if you click save, Sorry, we need to say all here. We see there's first a post to the site. This is a whole Drupal bootstrap and the post then returns with a 302 found and then it will load the node, the view. So if you wanna see the post itself, it will never be in the actual, um, in the actual view because in here you will only see the XHProf for the viewing of this node, not for the saving. There are a lot of different ways. One of them is um, actually in Devil itself. 
and you can say here that display redirection page. So instead of actually showing a 302, it will create you a normal page which has a full footer and xhprof happens in the footer. So yeah. <laughs> I'm disabling it. No. <laughs> so I save it and now it tells me I also see the Drupal set it's, um, message set and I see the user is being redirected to node 13 but there is hsprof in here. So I can go here and now I see no page edit, get form, validate, what are the cur ooh, a curl request, ooh, whatever. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, it's from my module, but. <laughs> ah. <laughs> so maybe I, well, whatever. So um, that's really interesting because I ended up in like having um, people telling me, well, no, that it is really slow, whatever. And I go there and you, no, it's 100 milliseconds, whatever. So that's one pitfall in, um, in XHProf. Even harder are Ajax calls, because the Ajax calls sometimes don't contain anything. Um, what I usually use is um, that XHprof, what it's actually doing, it creates files. For each single call, it creates a file in a directory. And um, if you open just xhprof.html, it shows you all existing runs. So for example, now I need to trigger somehow an HX call. Was it XHprof where you can add some parts of the URL to the file? No, I think that was Xdebug, right? Yes. Yeah. No, what ah, I yeah. usually use is like, I now I want to know this, I this HX call. If I type now, type now something in, there will an HX call happen. So I go to the listing and I see all queries and I remember the last number, whatever. And then now I type something here. Now you see there was an HX call and if I go back, there is another one on top. I can click on it. No, I can't click on it. That's a problem. I take one which works and <laughs> change the run number, and then you can see it. So um, there should sometimes, if you go in the HX, but it depends on the HX implementation, you can also see it here in the network thingy. So here. In the response, no. Yeah, no payload. So you will not, because. Yes. Yeah, you could yeah, send it by a Drupal set message or whatever. <laughs> yes. Um, hmm. Should we look at the slow website? I don't don't have any. You have no web slow website. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yes. Well, I only have yeah. locals. Yes. So, uh, how can I run this for a few seconds or uh, something on a production side? Okay, good, in, good question. So, Facebook claims they run it on their side as well. And maybe we need to check the... Um, oh, yeah, I have two, um, another thing I want to tell you, but that's good combined. So, if you look at devil module, how it works is... There's some xhprof somewhere. So there's a function devil xhprof enable, and basically this is the magic where it happens. And if we look into this, ah, oh no internet, boo. So um, you have some flags, you can tell wait, wait. them, and they say that you can. Oh, there is. Okay, there is internet. Is that the official one? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Well, doesn't matter. You, <laughs> you, you can check the flags yourself, but basically this tells it should measure the CPU and it, it should measure as well the memory. Facebook says if you don't do this, so if you remove it here, for example, and run one, you will still have an XHprof output just with less information. So if you look at the normal one, damn. you have exclusive CPU time and memory use, if you don't run this, you don't have these two, but they say it's as fast as no as without. So um, I what we used is that you have a random number in here, for example, and you only run this um, every 1,000 requests or something, because there is even um, an xhprof. I don't still have no internet, but there is a module xhprof graph, and it shows you the um, a graph about the speed and the function calls and all the stuff. 
So you can run it on a production site. I would just re um, suggest to not run it via the devil module because having devil module installed on a production site is not, yes. it's from performance point of view, not so such a good idea. Yes. But not generate the link. Uh, yes. Elements. Good point. So um, the link is posted. Let me find it. Yeah. No, that's not now. the right one. So um, xhprof. So basically, you say xhprof data disable, and then you make a new um, new object, blah, blah blah, and then you say save run. That's it. And then the link. Is um, is saved in here somewhere? <coughs> I mean, they, yeah, they just build it. So the here, ID. they basically the the ID is returned, so you can save the ID wherever you want. So after you stop XHprof, you get an ID, and then you can save it wherever you want you would like. Devil module just posts this in the footer for you, but you don't have to do this. One thing um, that is interesting, um, you see here all the time the whole site. And one interesting thing are these Drupal renders with the ads and also call user function array. So this can be really confusing because, so basically if we step through one, so we have main, okay, this calls menu executive handler, good, Drupal deliver page, deliver HTML, page render, and now it's interesting, okay, which render? Because Drupal render is called multiple times on the site. Then you maybe have theme. And so you have no idea now at which part the theme function was called. So sometimes it's interesting, like um, I did a lot of stuff in, in block. So I just, when actually blocks were called, I wanted to know what happens in the whole block system and everything else I wanted to get rid of. So um, what, this usually works, but in Drupal, a lot of things are called by a call user function. And for um, xhprof, that's the same function all the time. So what I do, I don't know if there's a better way to do it, but um, I just copy out this, what is it called? In the enable. So basically, if you do this, you don't have to do this at the beginning of the site. So if you want to know this somewhere later, you just copy out this in your module at the beginning of a function, the shutdown as well at, at, at the end of the function, and you get, you get the whole xhprof only for this function, and you can work in there. And all call user function stuff will be, or will be part of this whole system. So that's sometimes really interesting. Yes. Any more sure. questions for xhprof? Uh, Okay, any specific XHprof questions? Show a diff. Show a diff. Fabian yes. was talking pretty fast. Yeah, Fabian was talking. How does it work? So it's <laughs> you know the... Run one and run two. Oh. Ah. Simple run as one. that. The source I need to keep, eh? Yes, I think so. Boo. What did you compare, actually? <laughs> Well, two runs. Yeah, but you disabled for for some runs the this uh, some statistics. You know, remember? No, I didn't. Aha! <laughs> uh -huh. Oh, you mean I, I compare now an Ajax call with another one? This could be. Okay, one. let's do. Let's run just two of them. So we have one, and we have another one. So it's run one and run two. Yeah. yeah. And that's mostly what's used in, in core development. If someone requests some, a, a profiling, that's what you're doing with the XHProf kit. It, you get a lot of tests and then you compare that uh, to a proof that you're right with your statement about performance. And that's interesting. So you saw, I just clicked the page twice, and one of them was actually 1% faster. So it's really important that 
just like if you're really nitty gritty, small adaptions. The stuff depends on so much things that happens on, on, on your computer. Uh, like you see, I have all whatever tabs open and things. So if you really want to go deep, you have two versions, even disable everything else or try on a bare metal server, which only runs this, or just run it multiple times. And um, maybe we can plug here um, Fabian's XHProf kit. Damn, how was this if the internet? Ah, look. <coughs> <laughs> so that's line side is him. Um, and the XHProf kit automatically runs you stuff multiple times. Like 100 times, I guess. Yeah. Or you can probably probably can configure it. So if you want to see, okay, is it really faster? You just run the stuff multiple times. You take the average time, and then you compare the average times. So that's um, important to know as well here. A more scientific approach, then yeah, give it a shot. Yes. <laughs> and at the end, that's my local computer, and it's completely different to whatever you have on your production site. So sometimes it's really interesting to run XHProf on your production site to if you want to really, really see what happens there. The function calls shouldn't be different, but the, the timing, MySQL, well, all the stuff will... Yes, yes, exactly, yes. And sometimes it's, it's faster on your local, depends on whatever, like you don't have network connections and all the things. Or also the hard, hardware drivers, like, like the hard disks, if they have like barriers set and, and stuff like that, that ha can have a huge impact. Okay, so back to the, we still have a question, one question left. You mean hacking core? No, not hacking. <laughs> but uh, like if you've um, ended up for some reason with a very heavy uh, form and you want to, uh, and you want, you want your editors to have a, a, a very good experience or so what would that be a thing that comes up? So you mean actually like changing, not not hacking core, but changing how, how, how it is already in core based on whatever? Yes. How good is that? Uh, make it faster for editors? Uh, you mean on, on a performance point of view? Mm -hmm. Most of the well. time it's usability that we change it. Um, I have to say that node edit is not something I usually make fast because it's not what all the time is used. So normal editors, you can tell them, well, it's, it's, it, it's a bit slower. Um, what we saw is, um, especially if you have a lot, well, we have one website where the normal user actually n edits a node, and there we did a lot of things for caching of, um, of references, so entity reference. We have a site which has like 10,000 terms. If you want to show this in a select dropdown, first you have a problem on the browser side, because browsers will die from this. And um, another thing is loading because you couldn't end up in 10,000 entity loads. So of course you can either make entity load faster with entity cache, or you, um, you actually cache this form element. So yes, we did parts of this, but then it's not specifically, specifically between core and not core. Sometimes we need to do this in contrib as well. It's just changing, yes. But it's basically it's a form alter and um, it's a render array with, with a cache, the things we, that nobody knows but exist. You can really easily cache this then. Okay, they're finished, so we should finish as well. <laughs> okay, thanks. That's it. And as I said, we all three are really passionate about performance, so if you ever have a question, hit us. We are around the whole week. Hope to see you at the extended sprints, though. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, and if you want to help Drupal 8 faster, join us on Friday for sprinting. Just Friday? Well, Are you leaving Friday? No. Are you serious? No. No. <laughs> There's a whole week? I know. I'm here. So I don't have a problem with the for leaving. He has duct tape because his car was robbed.
Yeah. And so they. Yes. They also have some other ones just when it goes like good. Well, most of the problem is that you just have a lot of them. But he has lots of duct tape. So you saw the amazing empty booth. What do you need? Yeah, he needs duct tape. You need duct tape. God's duct oh, tape. Got duct tape. <laughs> I can get I it. I know that. Um, so most of the time it's a problem that you want to have uh, an and I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. And Google 7. Uh, yeah. And uh, and uh, should they yes. have trusted it? Uh, I have a beach cache set for uh, like uh, three or four hours, and yeah. yes, but not the beach cache switch to temporary. 